Welcome to Sobcast the Podcast, where I, Christina Wolfgram, beg the question, what even is mental health? This podcast is created in collaboration with Dive Through, a mental wellness company that actually knows what they're talking about. Trick or trigger warning! That's right, I have a little trigger warning for you. No tricks here. As you may already know, Sobcast the Podcast is about the pursuit of good mental health but we will be talking about some not so good mental health things like anxiety, depression, and white men with too much power. Sorry. Also, um, jokes aside, there are going to be some mentions of death and, um, I don't know, this story is a little darker than we usually go. So if that's not your thing, oh yeah, uh, the spoiler alert, there's also like some, a baby death. So, um, if that's not your thing? Uh, Why would that be your thing? Um, Maybe pick a different episode to watch or listen to. I totally understand. I love you. I want your brain to be happy. Okay, well, let's get into it, shall we? Before I started researching the Salem witch trials, the images in my head were cartoonish. Pilgrims dressed in costumes like a kindergartner would wear during a Thanksgiving pageant, peasant women being burned at the stake, cauldrons. But it turns out there wasn't much kitchenware in this story, and there isn't any burning either. The truest and scariest fact about the Salem witch trials is that they involved real people. Real people with what sounds to me, someone who is not a doctor, Like, real mental turmoil. If the citizens of Salem had the kind of access to mental health resources we have today, could the entire debacle, one that ended in 25 innocent people dead, have been avoided? Let's get into the story. It's story time. I'm going to tell you a story. It was a dark and stormy night in Salem, Massachusetts, 1692. Well, I'm not sure if stormy is historically accurate, but I'm pretty confident it was dark because it was definitely night and January in Massachusetts. So, okay, it was a dark and presumably very chilly night in Salem, Massachusetts, 1692. The town and surrounding villages, 2,000 residents either went to bed with the sun or hung out all together in their one room by firelight. There was not a whole lot to do once night fell. As I'm sure you can imagine, the Wi-Fi was absolutely terrible, and usually the only book in the house was the Bible. There was virtually no privacy for anyone because of the whole one room for the whole family thing. So please take a moment to think about how hard it would be to be a teenager in those conditions. A repressed in every way teenager. Maybe with undiagnosed seasonal depression. Woof. If it had been a Saturday night, pretty much every single person, maybe except those who were very sick or who had been born in the last few weeks, planned to go to church in the morning. Some families walked over five miles to reach the meeting house in the center of town. Religion, specifically Puritanism, ruled the lives of Salem citizens. The founders of Salem immigrated to the New World, can you hear my air quotes, to create a haven where no king or government could prevent them from making Puritanism mandatory, literally to the point of life and death. Like, You could be executed for blaspheming, blasphemizing, blasphemy. It was very serious. Being Puritan meant understanding that you were a mere pawn in the eternal battle between God and Satan every day, every hour, every minute. From a young age, kids were taught that strong emotions were the work of the devil. So you better repress them real quick. Just stick to your chores because with any misstep, you are on the dark side. There was no middle ground. Just boom, dark side. That's it. Besides the constant fear of pissing off God and accidentally landing yourself a spot on Team Satan, there was a looming anxiety about King William's War, one of the many stupid assaults of Native Americans who lived on on land that white people thought was theirs. 
I won't go into detail because I will roll my eyes so far back into my head I might pass out, but most Salemites had friends and family murdered (laughs) or uh, even taken prisoner during the last few years of the skirmish, and they were rightfully worried that they could be next. But don't talk about your fears, because feelings and hellfire. If the Puritan lifestyle was a runway challenge on RuPaul's Drag Race, the category would be buttoned up to the gods. (laughs) No, okay, seriously. Life was full of hardships, and um, no one was allowed to talk about how hard it was. Mm, And no offense if you or your loved ones are Puritan. I'm sure you're all very nice. But what I'm trying to say is that life back then kind of sucked. Women, of course, were considered weak and soft and more susceptible to the devil's influence and blah, 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 blah. They were supposed to be seen and not heard, but not... They were supposed to be seen and not heard, but not seen too much because that would be suspicious. So it's interesting that the two most important figures in the events of that dark and presumably chilly night in 1692 were little girls. Betty Paris was the nine-year-old daughter of Salem's minister, Samuel Paris, and Abigail Williams was the minister's 11-year-old niece. Remember that dumb King Williams war I mentioned earlier? Well, Abigail's entire family was killed in an attack during that war. So she lived with the Paris family, away from her old home, probably feeling quietly disturbed by those events. That January night, Betty and Abigail fell to the ground, writhing in what seemed like unbearable pain. Their family was horrified, especially when the fits came on repeatedly, unpredictably, and relentlessly. At a loss for how to help the two children, they called the local doctor, William Griggs. And as he examined the girls, he could only conclude what their ailment was not. It was not a cold. It was not pneumonia. It was not any disease he'd seen before. So there was only one explanation. Witchcraft, obviously. Instead of maybe getting a second opinion, the family accepted the diagnosis and believed that a witch was harming the girls. A neighbor, trying to be helpful, I guess, suggested making a witch cake to find out who was torturing the girls. She ordered Tichuba, the Paris' family slave, to make the witch cake. Tichuba spent a lot of time with the girls. Historians believe she was born somewhere in South Africa. I'm sorry. Wait. Historians believe that she was born somewhere in South America before being sold as a slave in the Caribbean. The Paris' brought her with them when they moved to Massachusetts, so she wasn't just far from home. She was far from her home and her second home. And worse, she didn't have basic human rights. Imagine the terror, the anguish, and the anger someone would feel being treated like an object in that way. But Tichuba was living her life the best she could, and when the neighbor told her how to make the witch cake, she followed orders. A funny story. <laughs> A witch cake, as it turns out, is, is, is indeed a cake with a very special ingredient, um, the urine of the affected girls. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's a urine cake. The neighbor instructed Tichuba to feed the cake to a dog. No one's quite sure why, but I like one of the theories that the dog could then be imbued with the power to sniff out the perpetrator of evil. Yeah, go get him. <laughs> when the Reverend Samuel Paris found out that this kind of spell had been cast in his own house, he lost his shit. He didn't care if the deed was done to help his daughter and niece. As far as he was concerned, the witch cake was the equivalent of calling up Satan and asking if he wanted to come over for family dinner. Hey, Satan, want to come over later? We're having meatloaf. Like that. Old Sammy Paris was so pissed, pun intended, (laughs) he was so pissed that he renounced witch cakes and all other forms of witchcraft during his sermon that week. And remember how I said 
everyone went to church on Sunday. So that means the entire town knew about Betty and Abigail's mysterious fits faster than you could say Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Betty and Abigail became instant celebrities. Remember, there were only 2,000-ish people in Salem? Like, the public high school I went to was bigger than that. And word traveled fast. In what I'm sure was no coincidence, several other young ladies began experiencing fits just like Betty and Abigail. I want to tell you more about the people who were involved in the events leading up to the Salem Witch Trials, but I have to note that Puritan people didn't seem to have a big variety of names to choose from. There are quite a few Sarahs, Anne's, and a surprising amount of women named Dorcas in this tale. Dorcas. It's short for Dorothy, maybe. Maybe the most important Anne of all the Anne's was Anne Putnam Jr., Huge props to Anne Putnam Sr., who pulled a Lorelai Gilmore, named her daughter after herself. Pretty badass. Maybe. Anyway, 12-year-old Anne Putnam Jr. was the oldest of 10 children. 10! Because Puritan life sucked, older kids were expected to act like adults and help their mom and dad raise the newer kids. So... It's real likely that Anne didn't get much individual attention from her family. She certainly hadn't been treated like a child in years. To make matters more dreary, she also recently lost a younger sister who was only six months old. There's actually a rumor that her own mother, Anne Putnam Sr., murdered her sister. I guess I'm just spreading rumors now. No matter how it happened... Losing a sibling that you felt super responsible for would be really confusing and could result in, I mean, super deep trauma. And it might affect someone even worse if they have to choose being pious over being emotional. Confusion over life and death, no love and affection, and then seeing two girls close to her age getting a bunch of attention from all the grown-ups for having fits. Yeah, sign me up is what I assume Anne was thinking when she staged her first witch attack fit. Shortly after, her servant Mercy and her best friend Mary were also regularly having fits. Hmm. (laughs) Worst girls night ever? Hmm? The Putnam family already wielded a lot of power in Salem, mostly because of their money and land. Thomas Putnam, Papa Bear Putnam, as I'm sure literally no one has ever called him ever, because (laughs) yikes, was best friends with all the head haunches of the town. And I'm not flat out saying he used his daughter in the Salem Witch Trials as a way to punish people he had personal problems with, but I will say that Anne Putnam Jr. was responsible for accusing 17 of the 20 people who were eventually executed. Anyway, we'll get back to that. Reverend Samuel Paris, still freaked out by the curse of the urine cake, sent his daughter Betty to live with family outside of Salem before the trials got underway. Oddly enough, her fits stopped after a few weeks away from her drama troupe of Puritan gal pals. Huh. Okay, it's that cool time again. It is that time again where I get to read an ad. Are you ready for my ad voice? <clears throat> Hmm. Do you feel like the last year has taken a toll on your mental health? Dive Through has partnered with mental health professionals to create a free interactive course specifically designed to help you work through your pandemic related fears and feelings. It gives you the tools to help you shape your new normal and create a mentally healthier and more fulfilling life. Download the Dive Through app for free on the App Store or Google Play. I mean, it kind of sounds like all these people probably needed that course, but um, I don't know. Who am I to judge? Okay, back to the story. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. After a month of town-wide fits, town leaders wanted the girls to point blame at someone specific. Judging by the accounts I read, 
I'm inclined to think that at this point the men were genuinely terrified of the concept of the devil ransacking their homes. They'd been hearing about similar horrors from the witch hunts that had been going on for the last 300 years in Europe, which, for the record, were the ones that ended in burning. And, I don't know, we have to remember, these guys saw the world in black and white. You were either good or you were evil. And they wanted to stay on team good. So the afflicted girls were pressured to start naming names. They claimed that nearby witches were sending their ghostly forms to pinch, claw, and bite them. And even though no one else could see these ghosts, the the girls swore that this is what caused their convulsions. They eventually accused three women. Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, yep, that's two Sarahs, and Tichiba, the slave of the Paris family. Remember... She was the one that got tricked into making that pee pee cake. Sarah Good was a homeless, pregnant woman who regularly visited the Putnam house on her daily trek around the town, begging for food and money. Her first husband left her bereft and bankrupt, and her second husband talked a lot of shit about her, despite knocking her up like constantly. Generally, she was considered cantankerous, which is a great word. But I mean, like, who who could blame her, right? I mean, I too would be cantankerous if I was constantly pregnant and had, like, no food. That would be a terrible hanger, yeah. Uh, one account describes Sarah Good muttering under her breath when people sent her away without any charity. With all the talk of witchcraft, rumors circulated that these whispers were her cursing. And you know what? I'm sure there were some four-letter words in there. But Sarah Good was just a poor, unfortunate outsider. Anne Putnam Jr. and her little girl gang had witnessed their mothers banishing Sarah from their houses and overheard conversations about what a grumpy freeloader Sarah was. So it makes sense that the girls made her a scapegoat. And I bet the adults were relieved to hear it. Like, thank the Lord it wasn't someone they liked. The second Sarah, Sarah Osborne, hadn't been to church in a while. The scandal. Definitely devil, definitely devil servant material. What the witch hunters blissfully ignored was that Sarah Osborne was an older lady, and she'd been sick. So sick she'd been bedridden for the last two years. Some historians believe she was actually suffering from depression, and I know... Some of us with depression would love to be bedridden for two years. Sorry, I just started daydreaming about being bedridden for two years. Sarah couldn't make it to her own kitchen, much less the however many miles of walking it took to get to church. But the town was familiar with Sarah Osborne because she had a bit of a salacious history. Apparently, she had an affair with a much younger indentured servant from Ireland and then had the nerve to marry him. I guess in a Puritan town, that's some Brangelina-level news. To complicate matters, Sarah Osborne was involved in some dumb land disagreement that affected Anne... To complicate matters, Sarah Osborne was involved in some dumb land disagreement that affected Anne's dad, Mr. Putnam. What a coincidence. With her failure to attend church and her reputation as a sinful cougar, Sarah Osborne's soul was already as good as tarnished in the eyes of Salem. Might as well add witch to her resume. And the last of the three was Tichipa. Are you freaking kidding me? As a person of color, a woman, and a slave, she was more of an outsider than anyone. Tichiba was an easy target. No one would vouch for her innocence. Mm. The two Sarahs and Tichiba were publicly questioned by town leaders. And this wasn't a formal trial, but there was such a huge audience that it might as well have been. The meeting house was basically a sold-out Ariana Grande concert. People didn't have a lot going on. Seeing three women that they all knew get hounded by dudes about spells they'd been performing on rich kids. 
standing room only, baby. Sarah and the other Sarah insisted that this this was all a big mistake. We're not witches. We don't even know how one would go about being a witch. We don't have Google. And the town leader said something along the lines of, You say you're innocent? That sounds just like something a guilty person would say. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. Tichiba was the last to be called up for questioning. She was asked the same questions as Sarah and Sarah, but she shocked everyone when she admitted guilt. In fact, she not only admitted that she participated in witchcraft, she also said that the two Sarahs made her do it. The crowd went wild. Like, what a plot twist. All three women were sent back to jail. Sarah Osborne died there before she even got a real trial. Sarah Good gave birth to her baby in jail. And the baby didn't make it. Like, that wasn't horrible enough. Sarah Good's four-year-old daughter, Dorcas... (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) This is really sad, but her name's Dorcas. Anyway, her four-year-old daughter, Dorcas, was arrested and put in jail until she testified against her mother. The court used her testimony to sentence Sarah Good to death, and she was hanged with four other women soon after. By the time poor Dorcas was released from jail, she'd reported... By the time poor Dorcas was released from jail, she'd reportedly become catatonic. She never recovered, and she would need a special caretaker for the rest of her life. Historians and this one guy on YouTube speculate that Reverend Paris might have beaten Tichuba until she agreed to a false confession. No one thought to frickin' ask her because they didn't see her as a person. Even though she was eventually freed from jail, she was never freed from slavery. No matter how her confession came about, Tichuba was never allowed agency of her own life, so she cannot be blamed. As Catherine Zeta-Jones famously said during Cell Block Tango, I bet you you would have done the same. The first confession of the Salem Witch Trials did set a bizarre precedence. Basically, if you pleaded not guilty, you were put on trial and were more likely to be hanged. But if you confessed to witchcraft and pointed the finger at other people who were involved, you were off the hook. It was like the worst multi-level marketing scheme ever. Over the next four months, 200 men and women were arrested. 44 of them confessed and had to live with the guilt of throwing the blame on someone else. I get this. When you were arrested, (laughs) you had to pay rent on your jail cell. Food and blankets cost extra. In some families, both parents were imprisoned at once, so their kids or, like, really nice neighbors had to scrape together some money so they didn't die in jail. Meanwhile, rich people paid off guards to let them escape. It was madness. And don't even get me started on the trials. Like, they were bonkers. First of all, there were no defense attorneys, so these men and women were dealing with this life-and-death situation by themselves. And because of their Puritan mega fear of the devil, they were terrified to lie. So in doing the right thing and telling the truth, they were putting themselves in line for the gallows. If anyone came to these people's defense, then they fell under suspicion. So it was blame or be blamed. And get this, the court allowed something called spectral evidence, which is where you can claim someone's ghostly form hurt you. So young women, probably scared out of their minds that they would be accused of witchcraft themselves, would have fits out in the audience. They would scream and convulse and faint and howl and in a couple of cases scratch at themselves and tell the court that the person on trial's specter was responsible. Like, While the person was on the stand, their ghostly form that was invisible to everyone else was like pinching and kicking these girls, just like right there at that exact time. It's very tempting to be like, okay, these tweens were playing a giant dangerous prank. But think about the grown men who were like, 
Oh, her ghostly form, you say? Sounds like strong enough evidence to put this person to death. <sighs> Anne Putnam Jr. was a star during the trials. She was like front row, VIP, had done her vocal warm-ups, and had already practiced pointing fingers in the mirror. Anne testified against 62 people, which was more than any other women involved with the trial. And you know... Back then, they weren't giving out, like, participation trophies. Like, she really earned it. And again, she was 12 and lived in the... And again, she was 12 and lived in the fear of... Oh, my God. Why can't I say that? Again, she was 12 and lived in fear of the devil and her powerful father and was the oldest of 10 kids and had way too much pressure being put on those tiny Puritan shoulders. So, yeah. We should find it in our hearts to pity her, maybe. I don't know. By the summer of 1692, 150 people were in jail. And the jailers were putting down a down payment on a house in Malibu from all the money they were making. Four more people died while imprisoned, and 19 people were hanged. And then, okay, and then there was this one guy named Giles. Giles? Giles, who, okay, it doesn't matter, who completely freaked out when his wife lost her trial and was hanged. Reasonable. He was so upset that he demanded he also be put to death because he was a big witchy witch McWitcherson. He was like, I don't even need a trial. Just do your worst. And the guys in charge of executions were like, hold my beer or like hold my mead, whatever they were drinking, like Hold my very warm well water. Anyway, so they squished him. It's called being pressed to death. Giles lay down on the ground and then people just kept putting big rocks on him. Ow. Legend has it that his last words were, More weight! Right before they placed the boulder that knocked him out. Is it weird? That I think that's kind of romantic. <laughs> yes, that is weird. Poor Giles. I hope he and his wife are enjoying the big Salem in the sky. I heard it has a great gift shop. All of these executions were public, by the way. So if you're at home and you're like, I would never falsely accuse someone of witchcraft... You might change your mind after seeing your friend and neighbor get flattened like wily e. Coyote. Like it was a really scary cycle of fear and self-preservation. So how did it finally end, Christina? Oh, I'm glad you asked, Christina. The trials didn't stop until someone accused the wife of the governor of Massachusetts of being a witch. That really caught his attention. He was like, this has nothing to do with my wife, but... um. I think we should rethink the whole spectral evidence thing. Maybe go back to needing actual physical evidence. It's almost like he had the power to stop it all along. Eventually, everyone who survived the Salem witch trials was pardoned, which I'm sure erased all traumatic memories, and those people could simply go back to their normal lives because... That's how that works. Which leaves really on one which leaves really only one question, right? Like what the fuck happened? Well, okay, let's start with Betty and Abigail, the first two girls to experience fits. A more recent fan theory suggests that well, it's not a fan theory, it's I guess it's science, but whatever. It's a theory that suggests that their symptoms align with ergot poisoning, which sounds gross because it kind of is. Ergot is a fungus that grows on grains, mostly rye, and when ingested can cause hallucinations, convulsions, and crawling sensations on your skin. Yeah. That could explain why the girls thought a witch was pinching them. It's so creepy. I don't know. Ugh. Ergot thrives in wet, cold conditions and Historians read people's diaries, my freaking nightmare, and confirmed that 
the grain Salamites were eating during the winter of 1692 was grown and kept in cold, damp darkness. Very sus. These days, we know that ergot can be used to make LSD and or migraine medications, which is cool and great. Love modern medicine. But back then, it was normal to blame diseases on higher powers, like... A lot of people thought that the plague was a result of people sinning too much, when in reality it's actually caused by bacteria. My question about this, as someone who is absolutely not a scientist but has listened to several true crime podcasts, is why didn't everyone else get sick? Like, so, like the Reverend Samuel Parrish wasn't like tripping out giving his sermons, and I'm sure he ate bread. Like, there's no historical record of him being keto. Also, getting poisoned by ergot is, like, really serious. It usually results in death. So, Abigail, Betty, but did you die? Personally, I like a theory that points to mass conversion disorder as the culprit. You've probably heard of mass conversion disorder as its more common name, mass hysteria. The American Psychiatric Association actually retired the word hysteria in 1952 because of its sexist connotation. Hysteria. It was once thought to just be a lady problem. And it actually, hysteria comes from the word meaning uterus and it's just a whole thing. But anyway, mass conversion disorder is for everyone. All genders. I love this definition of conversion disorder. It's a psychogenic disorder where mental anguish gets converted into physical symptoms. Essentially, it's an illness that starts in the mind but manifests in the body. Causes of this phenomenon may vary but include repressive family life. And I think it's safe to say that not being allowed to show emotion is pretty repressive. Not to mention the constant threat of hellfire. Like, holding in emotions can really get our body's wires crossed. There's a nerve. Okay, wait, this is this is a thing. There's a nerve called the vagus nerve smack in the middle of our brain. And it connects the brain to, like, the rest of the nervous system, signaling to the heart, lungs, and intestines about danger levels. And we've talked before about how being nervous for, like, traveling for vacation can cause poop problems. But, like, imagine what being scared for your life would do for your body. Like, and don't forget, these kids had either seen or heard of people in their community being killed in King William's War. Abigail freaking saw her whole family get murdered. Like, that'll do it. There are lots of examples of conversion disorder throughout history, but one that I loved happened in Tanzania in the 1960s. Apparently, during a school day, one girl started laughing and then just couldn't stop. Soon, students and teachers were suffering from this laughing epidemic, and the school had to shut down for a while. Yeah, the laughing lasted for two years. Two years! Our brains are so smart, but they're also so stupid, you know? <laughs> so we have two potential explanations for how the witch hunt started. But what made it snowball into such a huge mess? Don't you think it's fear? Just being really fucking scared and not knowing how to handle it? Even though it's interesting to speculate about the fungus and the conversion disorder stuff... It doesn't really matter what caused those girls to have fits. I think what actually matters is that adults were so scared of their own feelings that they started killing each other. They needed someone to blame so badly that they started seeing Satan everywhere. Like, imagine if the head town dudes had a few sessions of behavioral therapy, learned some breathing exercises. I still have a worksheet somewhere from therapy that has a guide to help you realize if you're catastrophizing or not. And they could have really used that. I saw some scholar compare hysteria to a stampede in the wild. One antelope gets scared, and in moments, the whole herd is running without really knowing why. 
it's dangerous. I mean, like, it's like how Mufasa died. Sorry. I had to. Anyway, maybe the lesson I'm taking from all this is to take a deep breath before you get sucked into modern day conversion disorder. We see mild cases of it all the time on Twitter. Do you want to be an antelope or do you want to be Simba? Do you want to be the governor of Massachusetts stopping the trials or do you want to be Ann Putnam Jr.? Speaking of which, Ann Putnam Jr. became an orphan when she was 17, leaving her to care for all those siblings. She never married and when she was 29, she publicly confessed in church that the people she'd accused during the Salem witch trials were innocent. In true Puritan form, she said that she'd been deluded by Satan. (sighs) She probably needed therapy more than any of us do, honestly. So that's my story for you today, my beebs. I'm going to include all my sources in the episode description, but I did want to shout out my favorite book that I read. It's called A Delusion of Satan by Francis Hill. I listened it I listened to it on some long depressing walks last year and it was enthralling. If you have any thoughts on the Salem Witch Trials, honestly, I've been thinking about it so much and I love I love to hear your thoughts. So definitely like go leave a comment on Instagram or I don't know. Tag me in something. Tag me in your theories. I want your fan theories. Also, your fan fiction. Ann Putnam Jr., Betty Paris. Was there some sexual tension there? Okay, I'm done. I have to go now. All right, love you. Bye. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. It would super help if you subscribed, left a review, call your grandma, tell her to listen. And if you want more, Sobcast the Podcast, follow us on Instagram. All right. See you next week. Love you. Bye.